My name is Bill Anderson. I'm a high school teacher here in town at St. Louis University High School. As you may have heard a couple of times through the course of the conference, we're also celebrating our bicentennial, so there's lots of excitement going on around town uh, this time of year. Uh, this session is on educating the next generation, and our first panelist is Dr. Nancy Tuckman. Nancy is an aquatic ecologist whose research focuses on recovering the biodiversity and ecosystem function of Great Lakes wetlands. Her 28-year academic career at Loyola, Loyola University of Chicago includes founding and overseeing the Office of Sustainability, serving as vice provost, and serving as founding dean of the Institute of Environmental Sustainability, the IES. Now four years old, the IES has 350 students in six academic majors. Her innovative sustainability work at Loyola earned her the 2013 Chicago Magazine's Green Award. Tuckman's vision for the IES is to form integral ecologists, people who dare to imagine a healed earth and who are willing to put their hands, hearts, and minds to the task. Please welcome Dr. Nancy Tuckman. Good morning. Thank you, Bill, for that introduction. And also, I'd like to thank you, Peter Raven, for um, not only inviting me, but for really being the, the common theme throughout this pretty amazing summit that we've had. It's nice to hear your voice over and over again, kind of grounding us. Uh, and thank you, Jack, for inviting me to be a part of this. So um, uh, Peter and I had emailed a little bit about what I might want to talk about, I think, in the brochure it says I'm going to talk about Healing Earth, which is a project that I've been working on for several years. So I will talk about that, but we decided it might make more sense to kind of expand this talk to the role of higher ed in the issue of climate change and environmental degradation. So my talk's a little broader than we had originally planned. Um, to just sort of set the stage for what higher ed is supposed to be doing, um, back uh, in 1862, President Abraham Lincoln signed the Morrill Act. And this was really to put money into building these land-grant universities around the country. Um, every state was supposed to have one or two of these land-grant universities. And the idea was they felt as though higher ed was sort of up there in the world of theory and, and um, philosophy, and it wasn't grounded enough in solutions. And just having gone through the Civil War, the idea was that universities could really help communities to build, primarily in agriculture and also in industry. So um, we have to think about how do we use that today, and, and what do we do today? So. Let's look at what the roles of universities um, are and can be in terms of addressing the major issues of our time today, which is, is climate change and environmental degradation. And I've listed here five sort of important areas that universities contribute. It, these are kind of our wheelhouses for education. Um, and I'll go through each one and just talk a little bit about what universities are doing and also what the potential for universities is in helping to advance climate action. So let's start with education. Um, it's my opinion, and I think I share this with a lot of educators, that every one of our universities, and there are about 4,000 universities in the United States, all of the universities should be teaching these issues. There should be no student that graduates, <clears throat> you know, there really, there really sh is no excuse for us graduating students who don't understand these issues or just vaguely sort of hear about them a little bit, and certainly we shouldn't be um, graduating climate deniers. So it's really, our, it's really our platform and I believe our responsibility to have at least one course, and I would you know, even suggest to go farther than that, that is required by all students regardless of what their majors are. So that's definitely something that we work on and that we can do. Secondly, for the students that really want to be a direct part of this issue, we need to start breaking down our, um, our 
silos around our different disciplines and really work together because this is an issue that's so complex, it can't just be dealt with by the scientists. The scientists are kind of at the center of this Venn diagram. You have to understand ecosystems and their structure and function. You have to understand something about nature. But really laid on top of that are all the human constructs from the humanities to the social sciences to the business schools to health, it all should be integrated into a curriculum. <clears throat> and then I think too, a, a really exciting thing that universities are doing more and more is trying to build this ethic of environmental sustainability. And this diagram demonstrates the inputs that come into a university in order for a university to do its day-to-day -day business. We need water and electricity and natural gas and paper and computers and books and furniture. All these inputs come into our um, campuses. We use them and then we have enormous waste amounts of waste that go out the other end. What we really need to do is skinny down the inputs and narrow our, our um, waste in our, our waste streams and then just do a better job of using and reusing materials on campus. So that idea of getting students involved in, you know, how do we reduce our waste, how do we reduce our consumption and doing a better job of using and reusing materials is an easy kind of a low hanging fruit, but it's also very engaging. And it gives students a sense of being a part of the solution. So it, it's um, very emboldening. It, it, it gives them, I think, confidence and helps to build some tools that they can take into their own lives. The second role of universities is sort of taking off this last slide, is really greening our own campuses. So we. We have these small um, campuses, like little villages, if you will, lots of buildings, and they operate just like a small village. People live there in, in dorms, um, but then there's work that goes on every day. Lots of land, lots of big buildings. They tend to be very inefficient. Um, our buildings tend to be old, especially the, old, the older, more beautiful campuses. Um, have buildings that are very inefficient. So what we need to do is walk the walk and not just talk the talk in our curriculum. We really need to um, take it upon ourselves to be committed to greening our own campuses, reducing our, um, our use of water and electricity and natural gas, get off uh, fossil fuels altogether, you know, divesting from fossil fuels. All these things go into being a greener campus. Um, what has helped us is these new organizations that are emerging like ASHI. This is the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. There are more and more universities that are becoming a part of this society and ASHI has come up with a ranking system, a rating system, it's really a tool that helps us all to figure out what is our baseline environmental footprint on our campuses and how do we build a climate action plan or a sustainability plan that gets us to a very aspirational goal of 100% renewables, zero waste, et cetera. How do we get there in time and what's the budget associated with that? So ASHI um, is really encouraging universities to figure out what your environmental footprint is and report it. And when you report it, you get classified into one of, one of these stars ratings from platinum, gold, silver, bronze, and then the ones at the end are just starting to get into this program and they're reporting, um, but they don't have maybe a complete report. Maybe they don't have their greenhouse gas inventory or whatever part of the report that they're lacking, but they're starting to get um, on board. And we've got over 600 universities that are now participating, and it's, um, it's very ambitious to reach platinum. There are only three universities um, that are uh, rated as platinum right now. So that's a great tool for us. It's very much um, organized universities, I would say, across the country with one very good uh, metric and rating system. I'm kind of 
bouncing through these quickly. There are lots of examples that I could give you of universities with education and greening the campus, but I, I wanted to be able to sort of touch just a little bit on the potential for universities and what they're doing. So let me jump now to um, the role of universities in research and technology. And again, this is just a very tiny example, but these very important areas of research are really being um, taken on by many universities. And again, I've listed a few of the universities that are involved in um, moving these things forward, but this is just a very small um, subset. But it's, um, it's exciting to see how universities are partnering um, with federal government agencies for example, on really big projects like the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research. This is a group out of Argonne National Labs <clears throat> that's partnered with the University of Illinois in Chicago. And they got a $25 million um, award from the Department of Energy for five years to build a new battery that can store uh, renewable energy from wind and solar. So it's it's just a whole bunch of scientists working on building this battery that has a higher storage capacity and requires less natural resources. Um, so there are 10 universities that are involved in this and five of our national labs that are part of the Department of Energy. That kind of collaboration on big projects like that can really move the needle quickly. So I'm excited about that. And, and here's another example. Um, these are older uh, programs that have been funded for a long time. The Ameriflux Tower Network, and this is an example of one of the towers, they, they tend to be in different ecosystems all around the world, but, but North America has a big network of these towers that have um, meters and probes that are monitoring all the way up through, for example, in, in this case, all the way up through the canopy of a forest to see how the forest breathes and how it deals with chemicals in the atmosphere, synthetic chemicals as well as you know carbon dioxide and, and, uh, and oxygen. But the idea then is to look at how does the biosphere impact the atmosphere and vice versa? How are the chemicals in the atmosphere impacting the health um, of the biosphere? So this has been a long going sort of monitoring and research program that I think is very big and has a lot of muscle and this is primarily in the universities in our country. We also have these last two acronyms, the long-term ecological research sites, are sites in different biomes and different ecosystems around the country that have been doing monitoring and research on a long-term basis, um, understanding the structure and function of these ecosystems and how climate change and drought and flooding is impacting the structure and function of these ecosystems. So we get a lot of really good basic science coming out of the LTER sites and a little bit newer organization is the National Ecological Observatory Network, which is kind of similar, but it's more again monitoring how climate change is impacting our ecosystems. The face arrays that um, Lisa talked about earlier today is another example of how we're measuring uh, carbon dioxide's influence on ecosystems. There are lots more, but it's just exciting to me that we have such universities are doing a lot to really advance um, our understanding of climate and how it's impacting nature. These last two things are more <clears throat> what we call outreach and um, you know public participation, but I think these are really important because it brings and builds partnerships the way I think that the Morrill Act way back in 1862 really had a vision of what universities can do for its their local communities. And I, I would say that I think we're doing well in this, and I'm, I'm giving you a few case studies here the Oberlin project, which is really driven by David Orr, 
um, at Oberlin University in, in Ohio. He started this project, well, first of all, he, he built a really cool, sustainable, kind of self-sustaining building um, that's their environmental science building right on campus. And he is leading that environmental science program at Oberlin. But then he wanted to take it into the town of Oberlin. And so he got the whole village, the whole town involved in how do we make a sustainability plan for our campus and for our community? How do we leverage and help one another? How can our research inform the way the city can be more sustainable socially and economically as well as environmentally? So they really built this thing right out into um, the community and, and granted it's a small community and so it's not there there weren't as many moving parts if you will in Oberlin as there have been in bigger cities that have tried this same thing or that are doing the same thing but I want to show you in the next couple of um, examples of how universities have really scaled this idea up so the University of Oregon started a sustainable cities initiative which is really neat and it's basically taking faculty and students from across the university that have different disciplinary perspectives on and can can add to um, the idea of how do we help a city become more sustainable in the way that it operates so that it's conserving water conserve you know so that its food is local it's conserving uh, fossil fuels, et cetera, making the city more sustainable. So they take these groups of people out into these various cities and they develop, they listen to the cities and they have many, many town hall meetings and they ultimately develop a climate action plan for the city that then gets implemented and they're always coming back and helping move it along. Well, um, they have decided to call the yearly program that they do the Sustainable Cities Year Program. And here you can see that they've already developed sustainability plans for Salem and Gresham, Springfield, Medford, and Redmond, Oregon. And so they're really moving across their entire state trying to help the state build these sustainability plans city by city. And then they've expanded and upsized this to bringing just this model to over 40 campuses in four different countries. So it's a seed that's been planted that is really you know, developing and growing across different countries, which I find to be really hopeful and, and exciting. Uh, J Janet Napolitano is one of my um, is one of my heroes and I just love this picture because it looks like they're looking at somebody and giggling about some crazy thing that was just said or something. But Janet is the president of the entire University of California system and all of its universities. Um, <clears throat> and she, along with several other university presidents, have developed what's called the University Climate Change Coalition and they call it UC3. <clears throat> so the coalition is starting with these 13 inaugural research universities that you can see listed there, and they include three countries. So some of these are from Canada, and some of them are from Mexico, and the rest are from the United States. But these, these universities are developing this collaborative prototype where they take their best researchers from all different disciplines that are doing kind of the same thing that uh, University of Oregon was doing, working right in the cities in their neighborhoods and developing climate action plans and then working with the cities to pull those things along and implement them. And what they're trying to do is stay um, ahead of the Paris Agreement so that they're not looking at a one, they're, they're not looking at two degree uh, Celsius rise, but a one degree Celsius rise and trying to build cities that can stay under one degree. So that's also very exciting and I just love that this is such a big uh, consortium. <clears throat> okay, finally, universities are very active and I think advocacy and activism is part of our outreach, but it's also, um, there's a freedom in universities that allows faculty to speak and allows students to speak and, and to um, you know, big, be part of social movements and I think universities play an important role there. Here's a good example. Um, 
the We Are Still In movement is really important, I think, for universities, but I think for organizations across the United States. It's, a, it's an organization that is helping to um, sort of coordinate all of the different entities in the United States that want to stay in the Paris Agreement. And to date, there are 2,700 signatures, and they include you know, governor, governors like Jerry Brown of entire states like California um, and city mayors. So last night we heard that the city mayor of St. Louis has signed on to the We Are Still In movement. And Rahm Emanuel, you know, did the same in Chicago where I'm from, but many cities, many states, and then lots of faith-based organizations, universities, and corporations have signed on. I've listed a few here um, in the city of St. Louis that are all signed on to the We Are Still In movement, and Sitton Energy Solutions is the only um, corporation, but we've got two faith-based communities and one university, so we have to, we have to push St. Louis U a little bit more on this. But basically, it's, it's saying that we are committed to this, we're not you know, we're not going to be a part of um, the Trump agenda. And since there isn't any leadership at the federal level, organizations need to just keep sticking with their own leadership and even ratcheting down harder and, you know, really trying to meet that Paris Accord or doing better than that. And if you were to add up the economies of these 2,700 entities that have signed on in the United States, the total economies, the sum of all these organizations, makes up the third largest GDP in the world. So we're, together, we're, we're only third to the US being the first GDP and China. And then it's all these organizations that are still in. So that's important to, to think about and to be a part of if you have an organization that um, is interested in this. Michael Bloomberg is one of the leaders. They were really big at the, at the COP23 uh, meetings, which was really exciting. Okay, and then another example of how universities do activism. Bill McKibben is at a little university, Middlebury in Vermont, and he pulled together university leaders, mostly faculty and students actually, um, to build this organization, 350.org. And everybody's familiar with 350.org, but it has really gone international. I mean, they've become a very powerful, especially voice for young people. But they, they, they basically have three goals or three approaches. One is to keep it in the ground. So they're trying to make sure that there are no new investments in extracting uh, fossil fuels from the ground in any new areas. Okay, so keep what's in the ground in the ground. Secondly, to divest from the fossil fuel industries, to put a squeeze on the fossil fuel industries, which will help to stimulate the renewable energy industries as well, and that, that you know, stimulating renewables is their third approach. And they do a lot of um, organizing big groups, and so there's a lot of grassroots, and there's a lot of big organizations, and marches, and protests, and that's how stuff happens. I mean, that's how things get done, is when people voice their, um, their concerns and, and make demands. And so I, I think that this is a, an effective organization. I'm a part of it. They've, I'm on call for whenever they do protests on the pipelines with the thousands of pipelines around the world, and some of you might be um, on that as well, where they will call you and say, we need people to protest tomorrow at noon in, in Missouri. And you know, so many people just drop what they're doing and go. It's it's actually a lot of fun. Okay, so <laughs> if you look at the different organizations, or they've got, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bill McKibben really needs a big round of applause. He's really led this, um, and he's got 850 organizations now that are a part of it across 188 countries. And um, there's been $6.1 trillion divested from fossil fuels. So that has an, it's got to have an impact, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now just in the last part of my talk, um, I've worked at a Jesuit university m my whole life, my whole career, which has been a long one. Um, and I really, I'm, I'm not Catholic, but I'll tell you what I would do. I would walk, you know, 
like a lemming off the edge of a, just like everybody loves to follow Peter, you know, he's like a Jesuit. That's how the Jesuits are. They're super progressive. They're really integrated in their thinking and they're soulful. You know, it's not just intellect, intellect. It's, it's really what, you know, what does this mean to us? What does this mean to our culture and to our community? So they're wonderful um, men to work with. We have 28 Jesuit colleges and universities um, across the United States. It's not the largest network in the country. Actually, SUNY has a bigger network, the State University of New York. But it's still br big geographically. We, we cover a lot of the geography. And we have a shared mission of social justice. That's really what the Jesuits ab are about, social justice. And they see environmental degradation as a justice issue, a as it should be seen. And so they took it on very strongly. And um, I think it was probably about 15 years ago when the Jesuits really got serious about environment and they very quickly realized how far behind we were. And so really gunned it to, to try to bring our universities into this framework so that we're doing more around teaching and more around greening our own campuses and more about advocacy as well. It is, after all, the, the poor who are disproportionately impacted by these um, degradations. And of course, we have, we have Pope Francis. I mean, what a great world leader. You know, it's, it's just really inspiring to have a world leader like that who's just so honest and true and good that you can trust and who's just sort of on target, really on target with his, his thinking. So, you know, this is my university. We, we have been and continue to be a climate leader in, in the country. We're not very big. We have about 16,000 students. But um, we really are committed to the environment, just as, as I mentioned, we're committed to social justice. Um, you know, this is a lot of the work that we've done in, in both our curriculum and also on making our campus sustainable. It was a major commitment, um, big investment, but it, the return on it is enormous, not just in terms of the money that we save from being more efficient, but also from the attraction that the youth want to be a part of this. They want to be a part of this movement. They want to be a part of the solution. And so we're getting more and more students into our, our new school of environment. And we, we host um, an annual climate change conference that it doesn't have anywhere near the muscle and, and the beauty of, of this conference, um, but it is kind of a just down and dirty, down to work, you know, bringing people together, raising awareness, talking about solutions, motivating people into action. And I think one of the best things that we do in our annual climate change conference is we bring together the people from the Jesuit colleges and universities for a full day before we start our conference. And we share best practices. We talk about how can we leverage what we have and, and who we are to each do better you know, at being more sustainable and getting this into our curriculum. And this man is really the leader of the, the Jesuit community <clears throat> in terms of environmental um, action. And he was the president of Loyola University, Michael Garanzini, for 15 years when all of this was really building and growing. And now he's gone on and he is um, the leader in the whole society of Jesus of all of the the higher ed directorate, which means there are about 200 Jesuit universities around the world, and that is the, the biggest network of universities on the planet. And so he oversees all of those and works directly with the presidents on major initiatives that have to do with the, the social issues of our time. And of course, the, um, one, one of his priorities is environmental and economic justice. And I've really been motivated to work with him because he's a phenomenal leader and he really knows how to get things done and he's very progressive and so it's it's just constantly brings me joy to work with Michael Garanzini but he has really gotten on top of this idea of getting all 200 universities around the world aligned on this issue so that we again can really leverage who we are and what we do and and he's started this international association of Jesuit universities just this year so that's exciting. And then finally, I want to tell you about one project um, that was listed in the brochure, and that's called Healing Earth. It's, um, it's a project that 
included uh, about 100 people from around the world from all these different Jesuit universities, um, we decided to build an environmental science textbook that would be online and free and doesn't require a password. You can see the, the website there is https backslash healing earth dot IJEP dot net. IJEP stands for International Jesuit Ecology Project. So this textbook was designed by the Jesuit universities to bring and to raise awareness about these major threats to the planet. We took these six topics from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. These are some of the major threats to the planet and also happen to be um, the, the major um, discussion points of this summit. But these, each one of these is a chapter, and the chapter starts, each chapter starts with a science, un the understanding of biodiversity. How do we even get biodiversity? So it's a lesson in evolution, and then it talks about the loss of biodiversity and what we're doing now to, um, to drive species to extinction and what that means to our livelihood and the livelihood and stability of ecosystems. So that's, as an example, each chapter starts with the science of that issue, and then it moves into the conflicts and the ethics the world in a worldwide basis, where the conflicts are happening. And then finally, it goes into reflecting on this spiritually. So it, it, it tries not to um, uh, push religion, but more just human spirituality, like what does this mean to you? When, when we lose, you know, the brook trout or the, you know, any, any of our species that we're familiar with and love, what does it mean and, and what should we be doing about it? And then it, it's a call to action. So each chapter really gets you to use your mind and learn about it and then call on your heart and motivate into action. So that's called the Ignatian pedagogy paradigm. It's the way the Jesuits teach, you know, and that's why they're such famous and fabulous teachers because it's really integrated um, in, into the world and it's not just in your head. So we wrote this book and we put it out there and um, actually Bill Anderson, who's the moderator of this session, is one of the key um, writers. He helped us in forming this thing and contributing to it. He now uses, he teaches in um, AP environmental science at SLU High here in this city. He uses Peter Raven's environmental science textbook and he uses Healing Earth kind of as a supplement to bring in the ethics, spirituality, and call to action pieces. So I thought that was kind of cool that, <laughs> that we had this connection through Bill. Okay, so it's being used by over 130 university professors in 14 countries. And, and what I failed to mention was the Jesuits um, have the, also the largest secondary ed network on the planet with 2,500 high schools around the world. So SLU High is one of them. There's a second Jesuit high school in this town, but they're everywhere. I mean, education is, is really their biggest ministry. And so to be able to leverage that around this issue, I think is important and exciting. And then we won this award um, from Pope Francis. This guy with the hat is a colleague of mine so um, I work primarily on the science part of Healing Earth textbook. Michael Shook is um, an ethicist and a theologian. So he really worked on um, editing all of the ethics and, call, and uh, spirituality pieces. So anyway, the Pope um, gave us this award called the Expanded Reason Award, which integrates faith and reason, which in layman's term is really just sort of um, spirituality and science. So um, I think that's my last slide. Oh yeah, this is my last slide. Just um, always inspired by Laudato Si and uh, by the people who helped the Pope to think about that and to write it. And I love what he says about education. It's really our whole way of knowing has to change. It can't, we can't keep teaching the same things that we've been teaching for years. So thank you for your time.